everyone and welcome back to my channel called Zona Reacts, where I learn all things bar with you, helping out to share my Slovak Central European uh, point of view. Now, in today's video, we are viewing part, we're going to do part two to why is world aft um, uh, according to Abaji Java and uh, run, on the Ranveer show, uh, one of the recommendations from you guys. And uh, I feel like, uh, you know, let's just continue where we stop uh, in the part one. We'll just, I'll try to link here. Um, but before we dive in, please like this video and click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, so let's continue from the previous episode. We're talking about Japan and we're talking all things US and how it impacts the world. So let's continue. In the 1980s, Japan was one of the powerful economies. It was the number two economy in the world in the 1980s. It was projected to eventually surpass the United States. I mean, the Japanese business policies and models were copied and studied all yeah. across the world. There was a real business and economic superpower. Yeah. There was a vibrant economy and a very confident nation. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting case. Right? They combined samurai uh, mentalities with business yes. to make more efficient systems and to make teams work better. It's, yes. a, it's called, I think, Japanese economic boom. Post-World War, Japanese economic boom. Very interesting case. Very interesting. And then suddenly something happened. All of a sudden, it's like somebody switched off a faucet, a tap, tap, and the economy went into a recession overnight, which it has still not recovered from. Today, Japan is a decaying country. It's a beautiful country with a beautiful culture, one of the most, the most technologically advanced society in the world and still very traditional, but it's an aging population. The fertility rate has dropped below replacement levels. Uh, there is this phenomenon of hikiki, hikikimori or something it's called, where youngsters, they stay forever in their parents' basement. They don't go out. They don't interact with the world. And there's a lot of suicides over there. Yeah. Elderly people dying alone. This society is crumbling and decaying. What happened overnight? They were surging ahead. And all of a sudden, something went wrong. Mm -hmm. I wonder what went wrong. Something behind the scenes happened and the whole economy was, was ruined. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. I mean, who's really running Japan? It's the U.S. It's the mm -hmm. U.S. that is really uh, uh, ruling Japan or running Japan. Mm -hmm. Recently, some Japanese politician actually said, said that. And then it was censored. That, it, that nothing happens in Japan without U.S. approval. If any important policy decision is made, there are U.S. generals who are sitting there overseeing that. And that's how it is. And similarly for South Korea. South Korea, again, it is a prosperous country, one of the highest GDP per capita, capita uh, numbers in the world. And you can see, though, that their society is being re-engineered. I mean, I have nothing against any specific religion, but you have a certain Western religion that is taking over the country. So there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are atheists and a lot of people who are increasingly becoming Christians. And that is something the Americans have been engineering since the 1950s. They sent, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of missionaries to South Korea, similarly really? with Japan. You I know? didn't know this. Yeah, you should know. I mean, that, that's the hidden reality of the world. Mm -hmm. If you look below the surface, you find all of this coming out. What's, what's happening in Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia is peaceful. Okay, it's, it's very well controlled, very rigidly controlled and all. Nowadays, there is liberalization happening because the Americans want that. So nowadays, women don't have to wear those, the, whatever they used to wear earlier. They can drive, they can leave their hair, hair open and all. So there is some change happening in Saudi Arabia, most likely at the behest of the US. But Yemen has been disastrously plundered right now. It's being bombed every day. So there is this famine-like situation, uh, starvation happening there. Uh, there are no supplies, no medicines daily bombardment from Saudi Arabia. So that's what's happening. It's a humanitarian crisis, but nobody cares because nobody reports mm. what's happening there. Mm. I think to understand the Russia-Ukraine situation much better, you have to understand who the enemies of the US are. And uh, people's focus is on Russia and Ukraine, but there is sort of this world war happening already. It's a Cold War 2.0, you could say, which mm. is happening right now. Right? It, right now, it's not really hot, but the pieces are moving into position for possibly a new war. And if a new war happens, a real war involving the US, it would most likely happen in the Indo-Pacific region. You know, when some motherfucker in a... Okay, I'm going to stop here because obviously we're right now see, um, obviously this is a long, uh, old video uh, as a recommendation. So this is from over a year ago, but it's still, I think, interesting to see uh, their point of view. And um, I can, I, I just... Uh, 
caught a headline recently of uh, Zelensky in Switzerland talking peace talks. So I don't know what's going to happen there, but I think that the second prediction was the other war that we have on the hands, but it's not in India Pacific, uh, but uh, we know where. Um, but yeah, let's continue. Bar tells me this. I don't get scared. When you tell me this, I get a little scared. <laughs> oh, it is scary. It is scary. Because if a war happens in the Indo-Pacific, it's the Indo-Pacific. Mm. India will be involved in that. Whether we like it or not, we will be pulled into that. In a hot war. In a hot war. Both you and me don't follow national politics intentionally. We yes, just we spoke about it. Yeah. Very quickly, sir, explain why you don't follow national politics. And why do you instead follow geopolitics? See, there's politics at all levels in the world. In your family, there is politics. In your building apartment complex, there is politics. At the municipal level, at the district level, at the state level, at the national level, you have politics at various scales. I am not interested in petty politics. It just, just doesn't interest me. I am interested in the, the competition for the biggest prize in the world, which is geopolitics and geostrategy. That is what interests me. I, I am a big picture guy. That's what I've always been. So that's what I look for. That's what excites me and interests me. Uh, these local elections and politics and all that really doesn't hold much water mm. for me. Yeah. Um, again, for me, again, the reason is just interest. Not at, I've never been interested in national politics. The moment I had my first geopolitical conversation, coincidentally with you, I was like, okay, this is my new subject. <laughs> but so the anecdote I do want to share here is I was talking to a host of really intelligent people and people from all faiths, okay, Hindus, Muslims, Catholics. Um, the one input I've got about the current Indian government is I'm not talking about a national level. I'm not talking about what's happening inside the country. And that's, again, a little bit of a gray area. Everyone's got their own very strong opinions on it. But internationally, suddenly, since Modi's at the forefront, we are perceived as a, hey, don't mess with me kind of figure. Uh, everything from Modi's branding abroad to uh, even the way he treats other politicians. There is that sense of power. Now, people criticize him for being seen so much abroad, for traveling so much. There was a YouTube, I think it was Think School, who did a fantastic video on the string of pearls theory. And he said that, why do you think Modi's traveling so much to all these countries? He's traveling to strategic countries to strengthen us geopolitically. We have gentlemen like Ajit Doval kind of sitting right next to Modi and advising him geopolitically. Ajit Doval, if you actually read his uh, history and about his life, he's one of the world's best strategists ever. I would actually link the video that Dr. Vivek Bindra did on Ajit Doval. It's fantastic. You'll get to understand what Ajit Doval's mind is like. I am dead sure. Ajit Doval has a role to play in India's geopolitical game right now. I'm 110% sure. He's always had a role. He's just a very senior strategist now who's probably heading that mission. So the Indian military is obviously getting prepared. Uh, but before we talk about the Indian military, sir, I want to ask you about Modi from a geopolitical perspective. Uh, while we don't follow national politics, I'm sure you're aware, as am I, but Purely from an international geopolitical standpoint, what's your opinion on how the world looks at Modi and India right now? So ever since uh, Mr. Modi came to power, the perception of India very rapidly changed. But for the first time in, a, in, in living memory, we have a no-nonsense leader who upholds the national interest, went all around the world. He met various world leaders. He met Trump. He met Barack Obama before that. He uh, re-established good relations with Israel. He established a very warm rapport with Shinzo Abe of Japan. And he went and wooed all of India's potential allies. And uh, he established very good relations with the Gulf countries. I mean, we have this cultural disconnect with the Gulf, very different uh, religions. And yet there is so much warmth and, and str strong strength of relationships between us and the Gulf countries today. So he did all that in the first term. Today, what we are witnessing is Mr. Modi is not traveling much. Today. Right now, it's Dr. Jayashankar who is traveling all across the world relentlessly building bridges and uh, furthering India's, India's national interest. And India's uh, foreign service, the IFS, nowadays it's become very confident. They have a very clear direction of what to do. Earlier, India's diplomats and ambassadors did not have a clear idea of what our national interest is, what the policy is, what does the government want to pursue as, as, as a big picture thing. Today is very clear. Everybody knows their role. Everybody knows what to do. So that's what we're doing. Our economic policies, the what we, what the government implemented in the past seven or so years, they are now bearing fruit. We are seeing unicorns born every week. In the coming years, you will have a unicorn being born, born almost every day in India. The entire infrastructure is being upgraded, upgraded the airports, 
the nuclear uh, situation is also good we are like you said we are building new weapons developing new weapons modernizing the military so there's this whole overhaul of the country that's happening or uh, we are also uh, looking into the energy reserves strategic energy energy reserves that's why we have good relations with the gulf and so on mm-hmm. because of this india has now become a genuine world power it's not one of the top two world powers but it is one of the three or four global poles so today what we are seeing is a multipolar world a multipolar world is that is when we don't have only one superpower two superpowers but three or four major powers so the two main powers are the us and china they would both like to see a bipolar world where they only matter nobody else matters but as long as india exists and russia exists and possibly france exists we're going to have a multipolar world france france right. most people don't realize this but france is a major indo pacific naval power it has multiple uh, assets uh, territorial assets in the indian ocean all the way up to antarctica for example the reunion island which is uh, close to the seychelles is a french territory and they have multiple other uh, territories near antarctica in the southern indian ocean as well and they have uh, a fleet of nuclear submarines that is typically anywhere in the world as an effective second strike option in case somebody deals uh, messes with them nuclear in, in from the military perspective so they are a major indian ocean power and they have an independent foreign policy independent of nato and the us and that's where us and france have lots of frictions mm. right so today the main powers are the us and china obviously and also india russia and france as well so we are in a multipolar world and if you will see if you follow the events india and france are cooperating it's almost like a strategic alliance today mm. between india and france because we are the two cornered people big Be- yeah because we all seek strategic autonomy from the us we do not want to fall to fall under the us hegemony completely so india is buying rafales from france the aircraft we are buying the scorpion submarines from france we may have certain other things going on behind the scenes which we will not which we we may not know about right so there's all kinds of things going on mr modi visits france uh, regularly mr macron also comes to india from time to time there is a good relationship brewing there so that is where india stands today india is now recognized as one of the major geopolitical powers in the world if you see the past 4 or 5 months since january there have been dozens of international visits to india world leaders senior diplomats foreign ministers uh, uh, finance ministers and so on it's a non stop stream of visits mm-hmm. and dr jay shankar is going all around the world mrs minakshi lekhi who is the uh, the uh, other minister in the foreign ministry is also going all around all around the world and india's diplomats are very active we are pushing back at the unsc un un security council against any bs that's thrown our way so india is now standing up for itself and as long as the economy grows we're going to be fine because if your economy grows larger you have more money for the military as well mm. and so on mm. could you like kind of sort of highlight this world war 3 situation mm. that if it were to take place how do you see it panning out is it going to be two sides against each other is it going to be three sides triple threat match i don't know what's happening because this whole india kind of coagulating with france makes sense to me due to my limited understanding of geopolitics primarily um got up from conversations with you but i'm looking at it as three different sides kind of against each other but has a war ever happened that way like has a three way war ever happened if you look at the history of europe there have been all kinds of wars small wars big wars multi multi sided wars and so on if you look at the napoleonic wars lots of sides came together against france at the time so all kinds of yeah there was even a 100 year old 100 year war scenarios have played out in the future in the past sorry and that's why we study history because that tells us what kind of things can happen again because human nature is cyclic human nature is predictable the patterns recur again and again and again these are the cycles of history that's why history is so fascinating and that's why if you study history properly you understand geopolitics because mm. you know what's happening right now mm. so if we talk about world war 3 there are several potential scenarios if the us pushes too hard against russia in ukraine they may provoke russia into doing if they corner russia too far if they leave them with no recourse then something may happen there mm. and when when, when we are talking about world war 3 we are always talking nuclear obviously i mean the russians are not crazy mr putin is not a crazy person he's not a madman like he is portrayed he's a very rational person 
he has governed his nation very rationally the past two decades right. but if you push him too far into the corner if you poke the bear too hard something may happen and that's what they achieved by starting the war in ukraine it was not the russians who actually started it the americans pushed them pushed them pushed them pushed them and eventually the russians had to fire the first shot and the person who fires the first shot is the bad guy it's always like that wow uh, what is in it for indian citizens in terms of we spoke about the possibility of hot war folks living in mumbai delhi bangalore chennai at least the metros kolkata because it's near the northeast should we be worried if there's a hot war i believe we should not be worried peace can only be achieved through strength you don't have peace through love and affection or mutual respect peace can only be achieved through strength that is the lesson we have to remember from vishnu gupta chanakya's life peace through strength today india is building its strength its conventional military strength we are building submarines we are building uh, we are we are modernizing the army the infantry and all that the air force and we have the nukes i just want to highlight something that major general gd bakshi told me mm-hmm. and that saket modi who's one of the world's cyber security experts told mm-hmm. me even as indian students especially if you're an engineering grad you can contribute to the indian military in general a lot by choosing not to go abroad and actually applying for jobs with the indian military to be a part of this change and right now india needs it more than ever so if you want to do something for your country and if you're at least a science grad this is the time you can actually apply and do a lot there if you're a coder and you want to do something for your country know that the indian military for sure maybe not publicly but for sure <laughs> is building a cyber unit as well Of because course. so is china and if a hot war happens there is going to be a cyber angle in it oh, absolutely uh, that's the true nature of world war 3 so when you say peace is in strength maybe as indian citizens rather than focusing on fear and focusing on our amygdalas we should focus on our cerebrum focus on thinking logic and adding to the strength yes um go on sir now i will let you go on <laughs> right so india is modernizing its its military we don't know about our cyber capabilities for the past 7 years we don't know anything that's happening i remember when mr modi became prime minister for the first couple of years there were this this hackathons students showing off their hacking skills coding skills and then it became quiet so maybe it was a talent acquisition search 100%. or something it's 100%. possible yeah and it's always the young coders who are the best you know mm. so i am quite sure we have a reasonably good or maybe more than reasonably good cyber capabilities which we will not speak about obviously in the public domain we have space capabilities as well uh we have a sat weapons we have uh, good satellites and we have uh, like we spoke about the nukes so we have the strength we have the ability to counter china in any way if they try something we have the answers the whole of tibet is open and barren we know exactly where their camps are their military camps and everything is it's it's easy to pinpoint it we have extraordinarily accurate cruise missiles the brahmos missile and other missiles as well so we can take them out if they start something we can even interdict the malacca strait if we want using the brahmos missile and various other strategies we are even developing a new kind of weapon which is a missile dev- a missile deployed missile delivered torpedo a torpedo is like an underwater missile but it will be first deployed delivered by air and then it goes under water and then it will go and do its final mission that sort of thing so it's a hybrid kind of weapon we are de- we are developing and every other week we have a new uh, alert out in the bay of bengal for some kind of weapons test or something so we are very busy isro drdo mostly drdo is extremely busy in developing and testing out new weapons so we are in a good position there is no need for the citizens of india to panic or be afraid we are a very powerful nation we have all the answers to anything china can throw at us the only thing is that i am sure i don't have to tell the government this we have to be vigilant eternally vigilant don't take the adversary for granted don't take them lightly take every threat threat extremely seriously and we'll be fine mm. so what india needs right now india needs at least a decade of peace and we can only achieve peace through strength if we have a decade of peace we could conceivably reach the 10 trillion dollar mark within 10 to 15 years if we have peace if india remains at peace so that is the key to achieve peace and to maintain peace for 10 to 15 years until we reach the 10 trillion dollar economy mark once we reach there we are a major power almost like a superpower 
speaking about history being cyclic india has been dominated by invasive forces because of the divide and rule policy primarily mm-hmm. um and even today the nation internally is divided yes. there is a very strong left wing versus right wing uh narrative that's going on in the nation uh do you think that both the narratives and i'm not highlighting one single one here both the narratives and kind of all the negativity on either side is driven through external chinese forces through psychological warfare or cyber warfare or our other rivals like for example could the left wing narrative be driven by america for their interests or china for their interests and could the right wing narrative be driven by someone else say russia is this a possibility it is a very good question so uh, today we are we are living in a world where national borders are in some ways irrelevant because of the cyber space so so what's happening in india see in any society you need different opinions different positions there is a healthy society mm. if you have only one opinion uniformity of uniformity of opinion that is not a healthy society that's uh, that's very strange that's monochromatic and and uh, unhealthy and unnatural so india is a vibrant democracy we have all kinds of different uh, political opinions and all and it is categorized as left versus right and nowadays the right is dominant because of the kind of government we have which came because of the right wing so to say the right wing viewpoint or world view of india so we have this clash going on within india and the question you have asked is very important very uh, yeah much of this could possibly being be orchestrated from abroad from outside of india because you see certain ideologies which are politically they don't have much currency in in india because we see the result of the elections and we see who's winning and yet these political certain political factions seem to be very powerful and they seem to have unlimited access of access to funds and all that so that is a, that is a very old trick in the playbook in the geopolitical playbook you fund certain uh, political positions in a in the target country you prop up certain politicians or you you create new leaders out of nowhere like mr zelensky yes. right and then you use that to divide the country fragment the country and possibly bring your sort of person to power so that you can control the country without actually setting foot there so it is certainly a possibility i am not aware personally of who's funding what or if anybody is funding anyone at all but it is certainly a very significant possibility and it's certainly what the news traditionally will not tell you the news will never tell you that mm-hmm. because even the news is sort of on one of the two sides and uh, media generally you see narratives um you know being drawn by journalists yes who sometimes draw very anti right wing or anti left wing yes. narrative uh you need to be able to read between the lines and most importantly the bottom line here is that the entire nation needs to come together and uh stop kind of focusing on elements of fear elements of what can go wrong and understand that the larger source of fears on the outside of the borders where we do have a threat in the form of china we sort of have an ambiguous threat in the form of usa as well uh you said something earlier on in this podcast about how america possibly could have funded the terror attacks uh, in, in that india saw in the 80s and 90s we know that the terror attacks were funded by pakistan pakistan is not an economic superpower or to be able to have the money to execute such large scale attacks they were getting the money from somewhere at that stage in the 80s and 90s most of the money yeah yeah okay i'll stop here i just wanted to add one thing that they were talking about like the easiest way to manipulate people i think is to make them to be afraid of something when you make people be mm. afraid of something that's your easy way to manipulate them but let's continue but uh what was the us's intentions for orchestrating terror attacks in india so it's like this uh in i think it was in 1979 that the USSR's invasion of Afghanistan happened. Now that was an expansion of the sphere of sphere of influence of the enemy nation for the US. So what they did was they started this terrorist training program Mujahideen terror uh, training program in Pakistan. They provided all unlimited funds to Zia ul Haq to start these uh, Mujahideen factories and they also provided unlimited weaponry and the idea was to wage a proxy war against the ussr in afghanistan and that's something that went on for the best part of a decade eventually the ussr was forced to withdraw so the american uh, strategy worked now once the ussr withdrew 
what happened is that afghanistan came under the pakistani influence completely that's firstly uh, there was this uh, northern Ali- there, there were this coalition governments that were there for some time but the pakistanis had created this massive mujahideen factory including the taliban uh, the taliban was created uh, during the time of benazir bhutto in the 90s that's what that was the beginning of the taliban so once the afghanistan civil war ended these mujahideens they were like out of work there, there was only one work they knew fighting so then they were diverted into kashmir there is the price the pakistani pakistan is extracted from the us we did this for you now you're going to do this for us so and even while the afghanistan conflict was going on there was this insurgency going on terrorism going on in kashmir across the border all of that money was being was being sent by the us all the money the training the arms ammunition everything and once the afghanistan thing got settled all of that was poured into kashmir there was i think 1989 or something when suddenly there's this explosion of terrorism in kashmir so that is the that is when the kashmiri hindus the kashmiri pandits were forced out of kashmir so that was all whether we like it or not there is there is no other way to say it it was all funded and financed by the us if you read the book sapiens you understand how religion can be used to manipulate people on either side i'm not talking about one religion in particular but any religion can be used against you your religion can be used against you because for you it's a sense of faith it's a sense of belonging and identity but uh anything that you give that much emotional importance to also becomes your point of weakness and someone can arm twist you and make you do things that you would have not normally done that's just how the nature of power and the nature of history is uh that especially when it comes to divide and rule policies people will catch you by the balls and make you do what they want like make you their puppet um so in a way what you're indirectly saying here sir is that everything we've seen in kashmir over the last 20 years 30 years all these indian military folks the indian military personnel who have been giving their life up for the situation in kashmir somewhere it's caused because of big daddy america yes. and big daddy america's geopolitical interests the pakistanis used the americans and the americans knew what was happening they did not care about it the thing is initially the americans had tried to woo india during the time of mr nehru they had offered india nuclear technology and, and much more they, they had offered india a permanent seat in the un security council to make us a bro in their cold war to make us a bro in their cold war obviously they will have their own benefit in mind but that's what they had offered india mr nehru said no 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 multiple times then the us turned to pakistan and they just turned their backs on india and then they started seeing india as a geopolitical and, and long term adversary because india went into the lap of the ussr through mr nehru that's what happened india why, became why a, did nehru side with ussr it's strange isn't it mr nehru was an anglophile he loved the british culture and all that he was a lover of the english language and all and yet he sided with the ussr not the english speaking world it's because he was a fabian socialist that was his ideology that's what he in, he learned and absorbed during his years in england there is this uh, society in england called the fabian socialist society it is a certain form of socialism which believes in very slow gradual change no revolutions no big reforms let's change happen very slowly that's called the nehruvian rate of growth of the indian economy 2% per year <laughs> so mr nehru sided with the ussr instead of the us then the us started seeing india as the adversary they started funding and financing pakistan and they were okay to see india bleed they had made many other countries bleed so they were fine with that mm. and then the pakistan is also the only thing that keeps alive the legitimacy of the pakistani army and army and isi is this threat from india the pakistani army claims that india is an existential threat for pakistan even though india has never started a single war with pakistan but that's the only thing that keeps them in power that's what gives them legitimacy in the eyes of the people the moment that legitimacy goes away the people will rise up against them mm. so they keep this threat of india alive and that's how they're able to keep this going so if you keep the kashmir terrorism alive then india will be upset unhappy and there will be this tension constant tension which keeps the role of the pakistani army paramount in pakistan more than the prime minister and the government mm. so that's what they have always been doing so now that big daddy us is gone they have big daddy xi jinping mm. for now mm. maybe in the future they'll go back to the us who knows what will happen So that's what they play. That's that's the game they play. Hard hitting question. Could there ever be a big daddy India for Pakistan? When India has sufficient money, even I used to wonder why doesn't India buy Pakistan out? You buy the generals out, they'll they'll move. The quest the the reason why this has never happened is that there are certain people who can always go beyond our offer. As in, as in, let's say I offer the Pakistani generals a billion dollars. China can double that any time they want. 
if i offer 2 billion they will offer 4 billion they can it's like the game in in uh, when you are when you are uh, bidding for something and people are raising putting up their bids and then you announce that whoever bids the highest i'm going to double it that's it end of story so then you buy the item right so that sort of thing the pakistani generals and dictators are for sale but india doesn't have the deepest pockets there is a bigger guy out there there are two big guys out there the us and china who have deeper pockets in india and that's why the pakistanis always go towards that those two quarters the moment india becomes bigger than china let's say hypothetically that's when we can buy pakistan out we haven't really spoken about putin much on this particular podcast and it is at the end of the day a russia ukraine themed show because that one geopolitical event has set off so much else in the world um again first covid happening then this happening i don't know what's going to happen next uh is putin going to be alive to see what's going to happen next because they say he's got blood cancer uh they say that he's sending uh look alike doppelgangers out uh and he himself is actually bedridden there's all these conspiracy theories about him out there right now what's the truth in terms of so how do you look at um uh, kind of putin's angle in this whole war and i ask you this because i remember the last podcast we did you had mentioned a line saying that if russia wants they can actually take over ukraine in one shot yes uh but they they aren't doing that so i actually want to know everything about putin because again as we spoke about early on in the show it's a few group of men at the top who decide the future of their country and therefore the future of the world in some cases so let's talk about the man at the top so vladimir putin came to power about a couple of decades ago he came to power when his country was in ruins so uh, after the collapse of the ussr uh, boris yeltsin was in power and what he did was he put all of the money of the ussr in the hands of a few people the so called oligarchs yeah. so the ussr was a collectivized society nobody held any private property but everybody worked and produced resources and uh, the economy so in in effect the communist party was the custodian of the people's money the wealth they had generated over generations of labor so all of that wealth was in the hands in the custody of the chinese of the ussr's communist party after the ussr broke up all of that wealth came into the hands and the control of mr boris yeltsin and what he did is he parceled out all of this wealth and all the big industries into the hands of a few oligarchs of a few people who is his cronies and then these guys proceeded to destroy those industries so essentially one could say that mr yeltsin was an agent of the west and his task was to liquidate the wealth of the ussr so that russia would never be a threat again so after he moved on politically okay i will just okay i can't really comment on that but i don't see how anyone in the ussr would be an agent of i don't know maybe true but <laughs> I think what I would the way I'm thinking about it is is that um if you have collectivized society no one like is um owning anything right and they then they don't they're not in a capitalistic system so of course they will come and destroy it um I think to me him being an agent it's a bit far fetched I think it's just uh, almost giving him too much credit. I think it's just uh you know the dismantling of USSR has happened. Now, I don't know, I'm putting my hands away. I don't know what's going to happen. And you've never run let's say a capitalistic society. Everything always was co- uh, communism for 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 words worth and for those people knew. So of course they would go and make decisions that perhaps would not be in the best interest of the country that's my read on the situation might be wrong clearly mr putin was appointed to power it was hoped i believe that he would be another puppet mm-hmm. but he turned out to be something very different and he set about rebuilding the russian economy and the oligarchs are still there once something is in place it stays in place kind of and they are too powerful to be displaced so he worked with them and he slowly rebuilt the economy it was stabilized first the russians were standing in long queues for bread and soup you know that's how it was so mr putin stabilized the economy after a decade or so he started rebuilding the military and by 2014 he took over crimea because there was something left over from history and i'm sure this this entire ukraine thing was planned for a decade or so because it was known what the us was doing what nato was doing it was expanding eastwards 
relentlessly. So once you come to Ukraine, that's a red line the Russians won't allow. And that's why this entire thing has happened. Now, when it comes to Mr. Putin, he's very secretive. We don't know much about his personal life. He is known to have been married. He, I think he has two daughters. Uh, it seems that he was divorced and he has some, some gymnast girlfriend or whatever. That's not important. That's his personal life. It has nothing to do with us. But uh, now these rumors that you speak about that uh, he may have blood cancer or some other form of abdominal cancer or something else. Well, there is no evidence for it. It's all coming out from the more or less Western media. We don't really know, know, know what's happening. I, I mean, I'm personally not aware of whether he's sick or he's well or whether it's all strategic ambiguity, like they say. We don't quite know. In case he is not well, then he would possibly conceivably have planned for his succession. That after me, who comes in? Because if he moves on, if he passes away and a weak leader comes to power, then his 20 years of work will be wasted. So there will be some... So I'll just stop here because obviously this is an older, older, older video. And uh, he just announced his candidacy for fifth term of being a president. So clearly there is nothing wrong with him of succession plan in place which we don't know about in the chinese communist party there's a very clear uh, method of succession you have to come to the top five in the party the politburo the, the central committee and from them from those guys one guy is chosen that's how it is and it's usually five years but now mr xi jinping has extended it beyond five years now in the case of mr putin there is no such mechanism that we are aware of so I'm not sure what the succession plan is. I, I think he's already crossed 70 years of age. So I'm sure he must have thought about it. But uh, we don't quite know. And maybe it is on, by design that we don't know. Because you should never not never let know the world. Never let the world know what you're planning. And I don't feel you can trust mainstream media when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine situation. Which is why I ask you, sir, as a geopolitical expert, what's happening on ground today? And what do you think Putin is making of it? So I try to source my information from various small... Uh, outlets like Twitter accounts and Telegram accounts and all in addition to the mainstream picture so that I get two sides of the perspective because in, in mainstream social media you don't get the Russian perspective you only get the Ukraine and US perspective so what it appear what appears to be happening right now is that the Russians are consolidating the their hold on the territories they've captured and they are inching forward and trying to uh, denazify those regions so the azov regiment and all they are being uh, made to surrender or being wiped out that's what's happening they are creating these cold drones which is encircling the enemy and then wiping them out from inside asking them to surrender if they don't surrender you know what happens so that sort of thing so they have not used their air force much they have a massive air force the russians have hardly used their air force and they have a massively powerful military but they have been very uh, restrained in their use of power. So it is clear by now that they had limited objectives. They did not want to take over the whole of Ukraine or even half of Ukraine. They only wanted to take over the parts of Ukraine which are Russian speaking, Russian majority. So that seems to be something they are close to accomplishing. Obviously, the situation is still contested and the Americans are pouring in uh, weaponry and supplies into Ukraine so that the U U Ukrainians can keep on fighting. So I, it looks like this conflict will drag on. The Russians don't want to overwhelm the whole country. It's not something they, they want to, over, they don't want to overextend their army. So it looks like this conflict will remain a low intensity conflict, like an insurgency for the foreseeable future. And the Americans will fight till the last Ukrainian is alive. Is alive. That's what it looks like. Mm. Mm, and that's, I'll give you a... And that's what it's kind of has been like, right? So I mentioned it right now you know, thinking about like this was shot a year ago um, that, you know, a year from then we're still in a war. And um, but it appears that um, there, there might be some peace talks. I just hope that it was not just like some sort of weird headline that I saw. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, it, it would be nice if it stopped. Uh, I feel like uh, Mr. Zelensky is very unhappy that uh, his war is not getting as much uh, media coverage as the other war. What can what can one say, right? Analogy from judo because Putin is also a judoka. Yes. In judo, when you're having a match, okay, with someone, suppose I'm fighting with you, no matter whether you're big or you're small, uh, usually a lot of judokas kind of hit the other guy's leg with their own leg, and you kind of throw these little jabs with your leg to just put the guy off balance and to intimidate. Mm -hmm. And then at the right moment, you throw the person, yes. and you win a judo match by throwing them cleanly. It's like wrestling or holding them down for a while. 
So I'm perceiving this as his version of hitting the leg of America as much as he can to just intimidate, intimidate and kind of put them off guard and a throw will come. And obviously my next question is, when will that big throw come according to you? That when is shit gonna break through? Is it going to be when China invades Taiwan properly or India? It could be a number of scenarios. I think the Russia-Ukraine situation seems to be stabilizing. It is foolhardy to make uh, predictions there. But it seems to be the way it is and it may stay that way. If if something happens, it could happen most likely in the Indo-Pacific. Either India-China or China-Taiwan. These are the two most likely spots where trouble could erupt. If it is India-China, it will happen before 2024. So we could be in, I mean, it could we could be in for something in the in the coming months, possibly, if if it is to happen. Otherwise, it is Taiwan, which could happen anytime this decade. The Chinese will make a move on Taiwan when they perceive that the time is right. Or if they start panicking that we are no longer progressing the way we want to progress and let's grab what we can before we become too weak. So these are the two main possibilities, the most likely possibilities, if something happens. I hope no war ever happens. I hope I, mm. I would like peace. But yeah, it's either China, India or China, Taiwan. The Russia, Ukraine thing seems to be stabilizing. Will a throw come from Putin's side? We don't know. Uh, he is somebody that you can't really predict. So he may also have planned something, but I can't really tell mm. as of today. So everybody, including the leaders at the top, geopolitical experts, citizens, army generals are just sitting back and waiting and seeing who flips out first, basically. Everybody is watching each other warily. Mm. Mm. Wow. Well, I don't know if this is the end uh, to the to the podcast, but uh, obviously um, none of these predictions came true. And we have another war, but war has happened on the last. And uh, I don't know if you read about this, but they're trying. Uh, so the things that I've read was about that this could lead into a, a potential third world, which is more about... Um, uh, Christianity versus Islam. So I don't know. That's kind of what I've uh, what I've what I've been reading. What I've noticed. I I haven't looked too much into war. I think um, I think it's important to to stay positive in your day to day and 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 keep living. Um, but let's see. If this is uh, the end to the video. Actually, oh, this was a good podcast. Sir. Stop this right here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was a very, very interesting uh, podcast. It, it was nice to actually watch it from uh, a year after um, as to what has changed and uh, what hasn't and kind of the opinions uh, of, of what's actually is going on. And for me, it's still the, the every time I watch anything like that, I, I, I find it um interesting but in a way waste of time because it is just like you're spending like an hour or two of your time yeah getting educated fair enough on perhaps what is going on but a you can't influence it and yes you are just sharing and hearing different people's perspectives but how does that make a difference to your life i would love to know for all of you that are watching and are interested in geopolitics how does that directly impact your life how does that make your life better how does that make your um life more profitable you know i is so so i, I guess I'm, I'm i'm very much about making sure that whatever i'm in a way doing is productive and that that thing Politics in general, I know, make zero difference in my life, um, with especially with COVID and now, at least in the West, we have recession. It's just only about you. It's only about you. So if you're wasting your time watching politics, you're wasting your time. You could have learned a different skill, right? Um, savage here, but that's just genuinely what I believe. I, I, I think politics is such a waste of time. I know we have to w vote for... Uh, politicians, I know we all want to have a better life, but man, you could be learning coding in the time that you're watching a geopolitical podcast. But, uh, you know, uh, different strokes for different folks, they say. Uh, and, that, and with that being said, thank you so, so much for watching this video with me. If you did enjoy it, please give a thumbs up, share, like, and subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you next one. Until then, please do take care. I'm sending much, much love. Bye-bye.